Hi everyone, how's everyone? Doing good? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, thank you for being here, really excited. So without further ado, we'll just get stuck straight in. So this question is for Timmy and Charlie. So for many of us, publishing books seems like something that's really far out there. Like, how do you even approach it? How do you even get into publishing? How do you even curate an anthology of people's works that you absolutely love? So I want to ask you both, how did you approach this? How do you write a book? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think, yeah, just for some context, I guess growing up, like most of us, I didn't think that book publishing was on the horizon. I had so many books in my house, read so many books, but mm -hmm. didn't ever think that it would be something that I personally would be able to engage with because it felt so, it's almost like quite mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. The, the world of book publishing. Um, but for me, in terms of like getting into that industry and like understanding it a bit more, it came through journalism. So I, I'm a journalist and that's my profession. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to meet a literary agent um, at some point earlier in my career. And that they, to me, seem like the kind of, certainly the, the most traditional door into publishing is that if you are someone who wants to write a book, you find a literary agent, um, you know, you pitch them yeah. the book it is that you want to do and you kind of take it from there and hopefully they'll represent you and you can, you know, move forward with that. Yeah. Um, the literary agents have got connections to publishers such as Penguin um, and they're able to put your work in front of them and then the best case scenario is you have lots of different publishing houses who will all be like bidding for your book <laughs> and you sell it for lots of money um, and, and then yeah you, you get a book deal and you, and you write the thing um, but with Black Joy it was a, a bit of a different process um, in that Penguin reached out to me asking if I'd be interested in putting together you know an anthology around mm -hmm. blackness um, but I think it was it was kind of after the summer that we had last year where there was a resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I think um, I, I wasn't necessarily interested in, in doing something that was just about blackness. Like, what does that mean? It needed to be more specific. So I pitched the idea of doing Black Joy. And yeah, and yeah it went from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even to write about Black Joy is quite revolutionary in itself, so hopefully we can get into that a bit more. But yeah, publishing can seem like a really daunting industry to even get into, so yeah, it's like you don't know what you don't know about how to access it. So how was it for you, Timmy? Yeah, I won't lie, I still find it quite daunting. Um, I, like Charlie, I was um, a journalist and did some freelance work for just about a year before I applied to be editor for Black Joy. Um, and I've been writing for quite a while. I've always wanted to like have my name on a book, write a book, be, a, be in publishing, but I just had no idea how it worked. Like it just felt like a very separate, closed off industry. I didn't, I, like again, I didn't know what I didn't know. It was yeah. just like, okay. Um, and I think the reason why I even applied to be the co-editor for Black Joy was because I just wanted to learn more about publishing because I was like, I, I knew this was something that I wanted to do, but I didn't really know how to go about it. And through being in the anthology and like editing the essays and writing my own, I've learned a lot, like through Charlie and through Penguin. I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> and how does it feel to see your name on a book, to be able to go into Waterstone, see your book there? How does that feel? <laughs> It's weird, and I, I actually still haven't done that, like, gone into a bookshop. Oh, my gosh. No, you need to get there I don't know away. why. I'm scared. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's, oh, I would be running just... to that bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird. It's very surreal, because it's like, you know how everyone has those, like, childhood dreams? For mine, my main ones were, like, to have my name on a book shows how young I was, like to do a world tour and <laughs> to, to like um, create a piece of art or whatever. So it was like a very like young pipe dream that I had. So it's very surreal that it's actually come true. Like, yeah. yeah. So I think a part of me is just like not trying to acknowledge it because it's actually come true. Well, after this, you need to get to a book Yeah, store. I probably, please, I'll go straight please, after. <laughs> and Atiyan, this next question's for you. So I really enjoyed your essay, Young Black Kings and can't wait to ask you more about its contents. But before we get there, can you describe to us what was your essay about and why did you choose to write about it? 
Um, I think my essay to like sum it up is this, it's kind of a critique and an embrace of the concept of black excellence. Because I think if we look around in the world, there's this, there's this idea that as a young black person, you have to be excellent and achieve all these brilliant things. And as much as it, like, it's really cool that um, there are black people who are pushing the boundaries and redefining what they're doing and really reaching for new heights, I think that's not the sum total of everything that we have to contribute as young black people. And that there's a space for our existence beyond our achievement and um, because even if you look at it like in a mathematical sense like how many people can be in these um elite and and those kind of spaces and i think it's really about the concept that our full humanity as young black people needs to be seen that's like our our good days our bad ones the the things that we are fearful of the things that we are hopeful about all of these different things are much more important than like the singularity of our achievement. And my essay is trying to reflect how even when we look at people who have achieved a lot, there's a whole genius of community behind there. Any person who goes out and achieves something massive, that's because other people have recognized and saw something in them and developed something. And I think often individuals exemplify and come to bring together the kind of, the things which exist within black communities. Like even if you look at, um, like Jay Huss is one of my favorite rappers, we talked about this before. Like the fact that he's doing this is reflective of the, of the creativity that we have as young black people generally. Like all these things, I was trying to like both be like, okay, that we have these ideas about black excellence, but like how can we push forward and be critical about this concept? Mm, definitely. That's, this is something that I've seen like shift from the days when I was in school or even at university. It was very much everything was centered around this idea of excellence and excelling and that we constantly measure our value on our productivity and if we're not reaching certain heights then we're failing or we're not doing enough so it's been really refreshing actually to see that conversation move on to like mediocrity which I'm going to ask you about a bit later but that's yeah. why I really yeah really resonated with your Thank essay you. it was brilliant yeah so Charlie we are moving on to defining black joy so I want to talk to you about intersectionality. So essentially, we're all made up of different identities. We like So me, myself, I'm from a working class background. I'm a mixed race black woman. I have Afro hair. All these different things that make up who we are. So what does joy mean in terms of occupying spaces that celebrate all elements of that, including your blackness? Yeah, so I grew up in Scotland, as, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I moved, when I moved down to London, I think I was very unsure of a lot of aspects of my identity, um, and in particular, my racial identity. Um, but I was very lucky that when I was coming to, uh, like, I, I guess, coming into like my racial con consciousness, um, I was surrounded by, by a really good group of people, so I was part of um, a collective and what then turned into a magazine called Gaudem. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and our kind of remit was, was focusing on telling the stories of, of people of color, of marginalized backgrounds. Um, and that meant that I didn't ever really feel like I had to shut off any part of myself mm. um, in my discovery of like joy in relation to my racial identity. Yeah. Um, I think prior to that, I'd always felt like I, you know, that I couldn't exist in certain spaces because I wasn't uh, like performing blackness well enough or mm. you know whatever it is um but Gaudan completely changed that so I feel very lucky and thankful um that, that I was able to access that at such a crucial time in me being like oh shit so you know the racism that I went through growing up in Scotland surrounded mainly by white people that was real and like this is what this is what it means and this is the these are the people who've been doing the work to kind of counteract that and all that kind of stuff was going on at the same time as me being surrounded by a, an amazing group of people who yeah. were very supportive of me as my full self. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gaudem is, did that for me as well, like from, from someone from the outside perspective. So Gaudem is a, yeah, a platform for women and non-binary people. And it definitely was one of the first kind of collective of people that I say, like the living in London, I felt like I could be a part of, go to the events and just feel like you're with your like your siblings and not really feel like you have to perform or like change who you are. And so yeah, that's that's exactly what it is, isn't it? It's about being able to access joy in all different spaces and not just kind of 
certain places for your identities, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I know that you talk a bit about this in your essay to me. Um, you talk about, you know, growing up in Essex, where are we both from? <laughs> Shamefully, that's where I'm from. <laughs> But you talk about, you know, not performing blackness through a stereotypical lens about, you know, your love of One Direction and just being yourself. So what, what does that mean to kind of be unapologetically you in accessing that joy? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it, it, means, it means a lot of things. I think firstly it means knowing like who you really are and being able to like cut through the white noise almost that is like societal influences like what your peers and like friends and family are doing and really ask yourself what it what is it that you truly enjoy and what brings you joy because it's something that I still like struggle to deal with now like it's really hard to know what kind of things bring you joy or make you happy because everyone else is doing it mm -hmm. or what actually brings you joy because it genuinely does bring you joy regardless of what other people think and I think growing up when you were a kid it's a lot easier for you to know what brings you joy because you, society doesn't really have much of a grip on you when you're when you're a kid yeah, yeah. and when you're a child like you haven't really like you're not fully aware of those kind of things so I think when writing the essay I wanted to tap back into a moment in time where I was like not thinking too much about what other people thought of me. I just mm. wanted to do what made me happy. And One Direction was there. That was yeah. what made me happy. <laughs> so like, it's just like, I think writing that and like thinking about it has made me want to go back to that um, mindset of like really looking into myself and thinking what makes me happy independent of wider society. That's something I've been thinking about lately as well. Like, when you read the book, there's so many points in there that would just get you reflecting on yourself and tapping back into that childhood freedom of imagination, not feeling restricted as much. Like, yeah, I would give anything to kind of go back to that and feel like I can just be myself freely. And I mean, that's another good thing about the younger generations now is that living unapologetically, living yourself and your truth and not feeling like you have to subscribe to what society is telling you you should be like. And that's a really beautiful thing. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. And I think as well, I don't know if this is the same for anyone here or, <laughs> or any of you guys, but it, for me, it almost felt like a wave. It was like, in your, in your childhood, you're like right in the top of the wave. Teenage years, you come crashing down because you kind of suddenly have this realization of like um, the pressures of society. And, and I just think that it's a particularly intense period of time. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it's a particularly <laughs> intense period of time in terms of the social interactions you have with your peers mm -hmm. and also kind of being trapped in a lot of spaces. Like you're kind of, <laughs> not to make it too deep, but you're, you're trapped in school. You can't leave. Like you are told where you need to be often. Mm -hmm. And then when you kind of get out of that period of time, you can start riding that wave back up again and, and rediscovering some of those things, as you say to me, that, that brought you joy when you were younger. Um, but it's a journey. It's always a, a journey. Yeah. I think, like, um, so I left, like, college, like, two, three, four months ago. I think, like, one thing that's really interesting is, like, remember, like, when, like, the COVID pandemic happened, right? And, like the exams were cancelled and all the schools closed down. I think it really kind of showed that the social contract that exists in education, which is that if you turn up and you do your homework decently well and you do some exams, that you're kind of guaranteed safety and security in the kind of the wilderness of all the uncertainties and complexities and intricacies of adulthood. Like, I think it's really interesting in terms of as the newer generation, I think we have to try and shape these systems when we're in positions of influence in a way that really allows people to explore who they are, even when they're in the context of, of kind of schooling and education. Because I think it's really when you can really identify what you're interested in and what you, you want to do, that's when you see the most progress and can experience the most um, joy. Yeah, I definitely think like the the people that are occupying platforms on social media and everything now are a real testament to that. And like the kindest thing you can probably do for yourself is to live your truth and to live unapologetically. And it's yeah, I keep saying it, it's a really beautiful thing to see. And so in going back to this concept of joy and blackness in the context that we're in, in the UK, in a in a Western country that has a a real dark kind of history and a past of colonialism, slavery, and, and all kinds of real like historical evils are even, you know, 
present today in certain areas of our lives. What does it mean then to be joy to, to be joyful as a form of resistance? So the concept of race itself is a social it's a social construct in that it was made by people. It was made by slavers who had a stake in the game, who wanted people to be oppressed, who who wanted some kind of basis for their discrimination and for like and what would turn into racism, right? So even though there's no biological foundation for it, there's no scientific foundation for it, it very much governs our lives. It governs our identities, who we interact with, how we interact with people. So what does joy mean then in terms of resistance and pushing back on what race was constructed for in the first place? Yeah. Anyone can answer that one. <laughs> um, so I was doing some reading the other day about... Um, actually, firstly, let me give some context. So the way in which I've been thinking about Joy, having put this book together, Black Joy specifically, is 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 to do with the collective. As much as I think... And, and also to do with sharing, like, and how black people share joy amongst each other. Um, and as much as I think individual black joys are, are so legitimate, so important to speak about, I think that's one of the concepts that, like, really fascinates me is the ways in which we come together or share between ourselves um, joy. And um, I was doing some reading about um, around carnival and basically the fact that there isn't a kind of um, like white equivalent to carnival. Mm. And I didn't realise that it's, maybe other people know this, but I didn't realise that back in, say, the 16th, 15th century, there were huge carnival-esque um, uh, occurrences across uh -huh. Western Europe. It was a thing. People yeah, loved know, celebrating together yeah. in like this kind of hedonistic way. But then in the 16th century, probably due to some kind of religious re reason, mm -hmm. it got stamped out. And so white people stopped kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it became this thing where it was associated with like savagery and like, um, you know, like the, the barbarians from like brown skinned lands, mm. they, they do that kind of thing. We mm. don't, we, we don't do that. So when I think of like collective joy in terms of like festivity and carnival and that kind of thing, it's a resistance, not just because, um, you know, of, of the pain that, that a lot of black people go through in, living in this country due to racism and systemic mm -hmm. issues. It's also a resistance because it's, it's something that they haven't had access to, like that they yeah. have deemed savage like for, for many centuries. And, you know, we're bringing it back. We're like, you know, I, which I love. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. Black joy being seen as resistance in my life. And I talk about this in the, um, is it prologue? Yeah. 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 Forward. 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 <laughs> forward. Sorry. Oh my God. The word just like left the my mind. Bit. The beginning bit. <laughs> um, the forward, I wrote about how for me, um, I realized that because of the histories of like racism that like literally underpin the fabric of this country, um, and being raised in a community where you've been, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say denied, but you've been made to feel like you've been denied feeling joy. Um, it got to a point for me where I, in order to justify good things that happened in my life, I'd construct this narrative about, like, undergoing struggle or, like, I'd almost work really hard or harder than I needed to in order to, like, f justify feeling this sense of joy, like, to make myself feel good about feeling good. I don't know if that makes sense. Because I think there was this idea of, like, if I just felt happy without there being some idea of like struggle behind it, then it almost wasn't worth worth it. And I'd feel really guilty. Yeah. So one thing that I'm trying to do in order to use joy as an act of resistance is just allow myself to feel happy and to have good things and do good things without having to work for it. Like it's important to treat yourself and to do things that make you happy. Whether you've had like a really good week or like a terrible week, whether you've done loads or done nothing, like it's good to center happiness in your life. 1000%. And I think, yeah, I was gonna hand over to you Atty because I know you speak about this. Yeah, I think, like, um, if we look at, like, history, we have this conception of history as, like, being a linear progression right to the present. But actually, the forces that shape the past just shape the present in a different way. And so, like, if we look at any of the issues that black people are facing in the UK or across the world, they're, like the new manifestations of the same underlying forces. And I think if we look in the past, right, we have 
the notion that essentially people kind of just took, like they they just let people do bad things to them and i think that's just not the the fact like joy is an essential part of our capacity to resist injustice because even as like we fight to build a fairer and better world, we also have to build spaces in which we can experience joy as black people. Because it's like, there's the element of like strategy and campaigning and doing the work in the various different settings to, to change things. But there's also the requirement that we can actually feel joy and belonging and just, yeah. Yeah, no, no, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off at all. I was just gonna say, I completely agree with you and there's a really good, um, uh, writer and theorist called Adrienne Marie Brown. Have you guys come across her? And she speaks a lot about pleasure activism. So if you're a person who cares about organising, who cares about activism, she's basically saying that we've been fed this myth that to to be an organiser, to, to start changing things for the better, that we cannot be experiencing pleasure while doing it. And she's like, no, like, you know, I have... I, I have all these amazing things that happens to me, like good sex, like good food, good, you know, all this stuff. And I can do that alongside my organizing work. And even within the organizing work, there needs to be spaces for, for pleasure and for joy. Um, it can yeah. almost feel like a prerequisite to being black in this country, that you have to be involved with some kind of liberation struggle, some, some kind of activism. You have to be vocal and be the spokesperson for your entire race. And yeah, this, so the, there's never any room for that joy. So yeah, I think what she talks about resonates with so many people. One thing that I love online is the NAP ministry. Have you heard yes. of it? Yeah. yeah so the NAP ministry, basically, they advocate for napping and resting and relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> Clues in the title. But they, they post some really poignant stuff. Like, it really makes you think, like, why, like, how do I measure, as you've said, when I get to rest, when I get to celebrate or enjoy something, why do I have to have reached X, Y, or Z milestone to be able to, like, celebrate myself or to, you know, feel pleasure and feel happiness? So... Yeah, like the NAP ministry, go follow them, <laughs> shout out. I think out. like a, a, a quick point to just add on top of that is that we have to reevaluate the systems by which we judge ourselves. Mm. Like if we measure ourselves through like um, notions of like productivity, I think that can lead to like really problematic situations in which we're judging ourselves by our capacity to do this other work. When like... That, that, like, we would never judge someone else purely on what... That, okay, that's the simplification. <laughs> but, like, but we should... I think we should reach, as, like, young people, but as, as people generally, in the future, we need to reach for new systems and ideas of judging how well we're doing at something. And whether that be, like, the amount of joy or... The, like, I think a really important thing is retaining space for joy, even in situations of struggle. I think that's a really important um, thing. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a segue, but I read an article a couple of days ago about people who call themselves time millionaires. And so, like, instead of um, measuring their life in terms of their productivity, mm. as they say, they measure their lives in terms of, like, how much time they have for leisure. So these are people... Mm. I'm not necessarily advocating for this, but maybe yeah. I am. But, like, these <laughs> people who, like, they have a job, but they do the bare minimum, and they, like, will go and take the <laughs> longest lunch, and they'll go for a swim. They'll do the things that make them happy on a daily basis instead of doing work and like just yeah. try and get away with it because that's what's important to them um I'm not quite there but like <laughs> I respect it you know? yeah yeah you gotta respect that I can't lie I'm all for that like some days you're able to get things done other days you might not but like it's being in tune with your body and knowing what you're able to do on that day and not forcing yourself like sitting at that computer not moving until you get something done it's just not healthy yeah, and we can go back actually to the idea of black exceptionalism versus black mediocrity. What does it mean to be able to just be a black person who is mediocre? Not in an offensive way, but just someone that doesn't want to strive for to be the first this or the first that or, you know, the best at this or the best at that. What does it mean to actually be able to just get through life in the way that you want to? I think a lot of it is about... Um like viewing black people through the full range of our humanity mm -hmm. like this idea that you have to be constantly and relentlessly pursuing some really statistically unviable things 
is a really weird concept. And I, I think a lot of it traces back to ideas and notions of like respectability politics. Yeah. That in a society that doesn't value your safety, your sanity, or like your fulfillment, that you can relentlessly work to place yourself in a position in which you can operate above those dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because like people aren't trying to do these things just for the sake of them. Like there's an underlying kind of calculation that if we look at like police and state violence, a lot of it is centered around not just the axis of race, but there's also the influence of class. And so a lot of people make the calculation that let me just work relentlessly and ascend my class position to move towards a situation in which I can escape these precarities. But we really have to ask like, is this the framework that we want to view the future? Because I think the, the, the kind of, there's a really interesting shift that's happening in culture in which like there was a moment in like hip hop where like individual growth and for, and like achievement and relentless like the kind of hustle culture was the number one thing but now you're seeing artists being increasingly influenced by concepts of the communal and the collective and trying to view beyond just themselves and i think that um that really forces us to reevaluate like am i just in it for myself and like how do we all collectively move forward and i think that's about us all playing different roles and recognizing that there are important roles um even if they won't make you a billionaire mm. yeah and just like to follow from that um because i'm around you, you guys are like all in school <laughs> i think one thing that i wish i knew when i was in school was to just like ditch this idea of black excellence and having to be the best and thinking that like and my parents were great like but they really instilled this mindset in me of like because you're black you have to work 10 times harder you've got to be the best if you're not the best no one's going to give you the time of day and like it really was ingrained in me especially when I was in sick form and then when I, when I went to uni as well and I think just in the like when thinking about my studies and school and all of that stuff. I think one thing that I wish I'd remembered was like why I'd chosen to do what I was doing. So like, with my A-level subjects, with my degree in uni and reminded myself that like I'm doing this, hopefully, I don't know if you guys all are, I'm doing this because I enjoy it and because I like it and there is a passion and there rather than like, I'm gonna work and read, like get that A or A star, like right, to get that two one when I'm in uni. Like I think looking back, if I could do anything again, it would be to, just be a lot easier on myself and realise that, like, I'm doing my best but, and focus more on doing my best and the outcome because I feel like... <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to say when you've gone through it, but you, like, you will end up being fine if you just do your best rather than focus on the end and being excellent and, like, being at the top. And I think when you kind of reorient your thinking and um, realise that it's not about being the best and just, like, being happy and doing what you can, you'll be able to find more joy. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's almost that that mentality of work twice as hard to get to just as far that like compared to your white peers, it, it was like a survival mechanism for our elders because that's exactly what they had to go through when they arrived to England, um, especially those that came kind of in the latter part of the last century or mid last century. And I feel like now, as we're the second, third generation, we're, we're demanding more from our society. Of course, they were also demanding as well. Like, they set the grounds for us to now have these conversations where we say, actually, I don't want to be that. I don't want to have to be excellent. I just want to be me. I just want to do what I want to do. And what you said about university completely resonated with me as well. When I was applying for uni, I was looking through what subjects there were, and I was like, what one's going to get me the most money? Yeah. Which one's going to get me the most esteem? Like, what's going to look really good? And I can think, like, you know, show off a bat and be like, I studied this. <laughs> <laughs> I went with history because that was what I was passionate about. And ultimately, you've got to get through that subject for the next three, four years. So, yeah, go with the one that you enjoy, right? Which brings nicely back to Yassian. Um, you talk about this idea of a black renaissance. What does that mean to you? And what, what is a renaissance? Like we're living in really exciting times right now. And I think that it's great for us to take a minute to pause and just reflect on where we're, where we're moving to. Um, I think it's the reality that if you look at like the, I think of like culture as often like the manifestation of our collective imagination. Um, and like if you look at who's really 
producing some of the most interesting and innovative art and increasingly occupying the kind of mainstream space is black artists. And like whether that's seeing like um, Stormzy headlining Glastonbury or like the work that's being produced by people like Little Sims or like um, I May Destroy You or all these other like manifestations of black British art. Like it's really black artists who are pushing and shaping the British like cultural imagination uh, in a way that's like not historically ever been seen before and I think a really interesting thing to kind of run off your question run from your question is like I'm really interested in what's the potential of that beyond just the existence of the art like I think the art is amazing but like I'm not an artist like I can't I can't I can't do any of what those guys can do but it's like how can we reshape society through the new imagination that people have because I think culture is always like too if you were thinking of it like a track culture's like two beats ahead of the rest of society. And it's like, what is the political, socioeconomic implications of people challenging, whether that be like the, um, the performance that Dave did at the Brits or the stuff that Stormzy did around challenging Theresa May and, and like Boris Johnson on, on their like abysmal records on a range of things. I'm like really interested in how, because that's occupying an increased societal importance how do we get other people to go and run and be community organizers or produce other types of work or do whatever they want to do but with that kind of imagination of i can really positively um change society and i think it's really a type of thing where this is happening in a very like historically important moment like if we look in the pandemic like pandemics are not um passive historical events a lot of the biggest changes um, in history happen after these kind of historical moments. And I think it's like about fighting for the new post-pandemic um, social contract. And it's like really interesting to see how can we draw together that kind of real need for the redistribution of wealth, power and resources with the fact that black artists are creating new work. So I think it's something we have to ask ourselves, like what is the political potential of this black culture of renaissance? Wow, that, that was an excellent answer. Thank you. It's one time for you. <laughs> so this is one that's like, we're going to finish now with the last question before we go over to you guys to get your questions ready. Um, but this is one that should hopefully be open to everyone. So you're talking about, you know, black people creating. We're often the pioneers of culture, often emulated, never replicated. What does it mean then to be non-black and to be able to engage with, respectfully engage with, and enjoy and to not appropriate our culture. It's quite a timely conversation right now. Are you thinking about Jesse Nelson? I am. I wasn't going to say it, but I am. <laughs> Black um, fishing, how do you avoid that? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think that there is this, uh, there is a really interesting conversation that has been had over many years, mm -hmm. probably beginning with like bell hooks, um, about cultural appropriation um, versus cultural ap appreciation and this idea of like othering people and things and mm -hmm. consuming people and things. Um, I don't have the answer to this at yeah. all, um, but I think that, that I certainly have found myself surrounded by non-black people who, ha who have made me feel respected mm -hmm. and who have not made me feel othered um, and have not tried to, in their attempt to um, appreciate black culture, they have not um, tried to gain anything from it, which is yeah. kind of what Bell Hooks talks about, right? She talks about this idea that um, when when say like uh, a white man is, is, is dating a black woman, um, they might talk about it with their friends in this way of like, oh, I wanna try a bit of that, I wanna, mm. and it's because they see you as an other, and so they wanna gain some of that otherness for themselves, because yeah. they think it's gonna kind of benefit them in some way. Um, and I think if we can move past that, that is when we, and, and same with like, not to, I don't want to hate on Jesse too much, but like, I definitely felt like the whole way, the whole way in which, she, literally the video is called Boys, right? Boys, bad boys, whatever yeah. it is. Um, and all of them were black men. Oh, is it? Yeah, a lot of them were. Yeah. Oh dear, I haven't watched it, as you can tell. I've just, I haven't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't watch it? Okay, okay. It's we'll on Twitter. It. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, when Diddy's song came out. And that was iconic. So to see Jesse's one, is, oh dear. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, yeah. you continue. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. Um, no, I was just gonna say, but yeah, that was that's literally about her 
taking bits of their culture yeah, while yeah. also using them as sexual ob objects, right? Like, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if we can move past that, I think that we can get to a better place. Yeah, I think yeah. you've drawn on some really important issues there. The fetishization of black women, of black men, that, like, proximity to the culture that gives you some kind of clout or power. And, yeah, I'll pass on to you. Yeah, and I think, like, just the... Uh, I, this idea of the other, I think, is really important because if you see a group of people as the other, you kind of don't respect them enough to treat their culture properly. So you yeah. think you just take elements of it. Yeah. And then when you treat another group as the other, you kind of make them into this like exotic entity. So you think by by taking things from their culture, it makes you more interesting and more cool. And I think, yeah, if we try and do away with this idea of blackness or like black art being like the other, hopefully it means that people can engage with it and enjoy it with a level of respect. Because um, it's, or maybe it's like silly for me to say because I'm black, but I just find cultural appropriation just like, I don't even get how you can get there. Just enjoy it without like trying to make it yours. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, because I, I feel like as a black person, maybe it's because I'm fully aware that blackness is so multifaceted. So there's elements of my experience that other people enjoy that are from my experience or other elements of the black experience that I haven't necessarily been through, but I can enjoy so like the Caribbean experience or like mm. South African experiences, like all of these things I'm able to enjoy, even though I'm a black Brit that is of West African heritage. So maybe it is just like when you're from in a in a community that is used to being the other, you're able to treat different communities with respect. But yeah, yeah it's something that like, I just, obviously I, I, I understand it, but I also don't understand it because I'm like, how can you be so stupid? But yeah. <laughs> It's like in the Western context, right? The, the dynamics between whiteness and blackness has always been a position of whiteness taking from blackness all the way throughout, like obviously since the like, advent of slavery, all the way through to today. So I think it's just an extension of that. It's, it's evolved to now, instead of taking our bodies, they're taking our culture and just doing it in a way that isn't respecting it in the same way that if there was cultures outside of our own, we'd approach it with a bit more sensitivity, delicacy and um, delicateness, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Franz? Yeah, I think, I think um, it's like, there can be moments of cultural exchange and synthesis which are not exploitation. Yeah. Like if we look at any kind of, most cultures are kind of the amalgamation and combination of different cultural forces, whether that be because of like geographical location or like shared um, heritage or background. But there's clearly other types of exploitation that we're seeing here, other types of like cultural interaction which are clearly exploitative mm -hmm. and used to advance the interest of capital rather than communities. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of, like, it's not just about the sharing of culture, it's about the way you share culture. And particularly from people who want to kind of take from black culture but not do anything to support or recognize the struggle which exists as a result of those social conditions. It's like those people who rap like really violent la like lyrics but they don't take any um, attempt to understand or like they demonize the communities who are experiencing the conditions which have led to the formulation of this music. Mm. Definitely. There's something that happened quite recently with TikTokers, black TikTokers. They all went on strike because yeah. their dance moves were being basically replicated by white TikTokers and then they were getting invited on Jimmy Fallon and all these primetime shows, making loads of money off of it. And then only afterwards were they then invited to the platform after people had already made bulk of their money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely in terms of what you're talking about, culture being appropriated for capital... For sure, yeah. Yeah, it's like we really have to think about like what is the best way of 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 kind of organizing the structures around art. Because yeah. I really think we need to move into a space where there's a fairer um, kind of distribution of of resources. Like we have to ask how can the communities who see who who produce these artists and the and the art there actually see some of the benefit from that. I think we need to th think about like the way that um, inequality also manifests itself in the context of, like, the profits from different forms of art. Yeah. I'd vote for you as my youth MP, man. Very articulate. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you so much, everyone. We're now going to go over and open up the floor to you all. I hope you've got questions ready. Um, hi. Hiya. <laughs> that was loud. Um, um, I'm Anna, nice to meet you. Um, so we actually wrote some questions down before this because a lot of us had a lot of things that we wanted to ask. Um, one of the questions that I got from the students was, um, um, like, what inspired you to write a book? Of course, it's your own personal struggles and your own personal you know, experiences, etc. But like, what made you sit down and say, I'm going to write a book about this? Yeah. I think that could be open to all of you. Yeah. Any yeah. of you want to take it? Um, yeah, so I think it was, um, it, it, it was off the back of, of the events of, of last summer um, where we saw basically a worldwide protest movement in uh, support of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, and it got me thinking about the consumption of media um, in, in society that, that revolves around black trauma and black pain. And the fact that in the UK, at least, there wasn't kind of a, uh, an active movement that, that directly l looked into, explored black joy, um, uncovered what that means to people and, and how we can access it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what had me sit down and literally write the email, being like, what do you think of Black Joy <laughs> as a theme and like as something to be explored? Um, I think hopefully it was a bit more articulate than that. <laughs> I, I, it wasn't just Black Joy, question mark. Yeah, but yeah, that's what, that's what instigated the email, yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll talk about the essay that I wrote. Um, so my essay was about this... Um, term that I coined called stranger communities and it's this feeling of joy that you get when you're surrounded by a group of strangers um, that are that have gathered for like the same purpose so the example that I used was going to my first concert which was One Direction and how that <laughs> led me to get really involved in the One Direction fandom and how like online communities have been basically pivotal in my own personal growth um, and I think what inspired me to write that essay was I was really struggling to think of something to write for the anthology. Um, and in my head, I was really going to, like, the, the things that I thought were obvious about um, being black. So, like, Afrobeat, so, like, jollof rice and um, the, the big things in black culture. But when I was, like, thinking of things to actually write about when it came to them, I couldn't really think of, like, a an idea that was like super personal to me. So I just kind of took a step back and I was like, what, what are the big things that have made me really happy? Where like I've experienced levels of joy that are just like unparalleled. <laughs> and I think the first thing that I thought of was One Direction's first album. I like seeing them on X Factor and just like having their poster up on my wall and like listening to their music. Um, and yeah, I think it was similar to what I said right at the beginning, um, answering Sophia's first question. It was something that brought me joy that kind of felt independent of the world around me. Like, it was it's a really personal thing that brought me joy. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I can't... I think I That's kind a of beautiful answer. That. Yeah, Thank okay, you. cool. <laughs> That's it. Um, it's questions about, like, why we decided to write what we did, right? Um... I think my thing is like if we look at like my my is that is, is that thing about like um, black mediocrity and black excellence. I think my thing was like I wanted to explore and challenge my own notions of like black excellence, because often like we can turn the mirror and look out into the world and see all these problems, but these problems are also within our own mindset because like we're socialized and shaped by society. So um, I really wanted to like understand and interrogate my own conceptions around black excellence and actually try go beyond the thinking that it was a purely good concept. Yeah, I love that. So I'll just really quickly, I was just going to say to add to that, I think sometimes one of the, for, for me as a writer, one of the first steps in um, disrupting my kind of negative like worldviews is articulating them and like, articulating why they're bad or wrong. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think that's cool. And I think it kind of manifested itself. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell this story. But the idea that I <laughs> initially told um, Charlie about, um, Charlie was kind of like, yeah, I like it, but not really. Then I had to, then I had to <laughs> go and like... Decline. <laughs> then, then, then I had to go and like rethink it a bit. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, actually, my idea, first idea wasn't what I wrote. I think mine was about, like, black love and falling in love for the first time and, like, all that boring stuff. Um, <laughs> That's good stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. But Very I my wrestling right now. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I think with that, again, it was me wanting to be deep. I wanted to like be like really introspective and like oh yeah black love and like oh therapy you know oh, <laughs> mental health and all of that but I was like nah you know what one direction say my look yeah <laughs> and we thank you for it <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for the question does anyone else have any questions yeah so it's been touched upon how blackness is usually like associated with negative connotations such as police brutality slavery or racism and that's why you felt it was significant to focus on black joy instead of this but do you think it's possible that black joy as a construct wouldn't exist without the trauma that we've experienced previously as a race that's an excellent question i can't see i think you're buried between people that's an excellent question who would like to hate that one I can start. Yeah, yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, that is a really good question, and I'm, I'm glad you've asked that so we can clarify. Um, I think the intention of Charlie and myself isn't to undermine those experiences or to invalidate them. If anything, we're trying to, and Charlie always puts this perfectly, balance the scales. We believe that a lot of energy has been put into discussing topics like you mentioned, like police brutality, like institutional racism. And those those are very valid, real parts of the black experience. Like we're not sitting here being like, yeah, they don't matter. Like just make yourself happy, like smile through the pain. Like, no, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> what we want to do is just, yeah, like balance the scales and encourage black people to think more about the things that make us happy, just so that we don't see our blackness as being solely defined through the pain and trauma, because there's so much more to being black than that. Like, I love being a black woman. Like, being black is something that I wouldn't trade for the world. So it's really important to almost interrogate why that is the case, and what is it about my blackness that makes me not want to be any different? Yeah. Um, yeah, I completely agree with everything you said, and I guess, guess just to add to it, it kind of goes back to what you said right at the beginning about race being a social construct and why blackness has been constructed in the way that it has. And so to your like ultimate question, like would, if we hadn't been through as a race, the things that we've been through, would there be, um, would black joy exist? Like probably not, like there's not, you know, a movement to celebrate white joy because yeah. it, it didn't need to exist because white people haven't been oppressed in the ways that we have. But that doesn't mean that it can't, blossom and bloom into something that is um is stays unique and stays special and stays growing even as hopefully we move to a state within societies where the frameworks change and we become less oppressed um but yeah i think that's a great question and definitely something to remind ourselves of that like um yeah blackness is a social contract like it is and we, yeah, yeah. we, we should never forget i mean the it. book was very timely and it was a breath of fresh air following the events of last year it was a necessary book absolutely um yeah i think that's a really cool and interesting question and the kind of initial thought that i've just had right now is that like it's, it's interesting to talk about rebalancing the scales but it's, it goes back to like our conceptions of history like i really think if we look at like the history of um black people across the world um like i think the the processes of like empire slavery and colonialism are in a thousand years going to be seen as a kind of one moment that's much that's part of a much broader and like a story with more depth because right now like you could if you spent your time inside like some of these really like um bias like history curriculum like in in the classroom you could think that kind of empire and colonialism and slavery are the sum total of african history mm -hmm. and the history of black people and i think we really have to interrogate and and look beyond that like how many people here know about like the the existence of all the pre-colonial african societies and that's not to say they were kind of some kind of romanticized paradise, because like that's not true. Some a lot of them had like feudal systems. There were a lot of other injustices. But we really have to interrogate and go beyond this idea that struggle is the defining thing about black people. Yeah, I hear you. But I'm gonna challenge that a little bit just because I think that well, it I, I guess it depends on on how you're identifying black people, right? Because like 
in, I guess in my mind when I'm thinking sadly, and it's, it's not necessarily a good thing, it's a messed up thing, I'm thinking about when we were told we were black. And that, 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 that is when we had to create black joy because yeah. we were oppressed. In, in our conception of black people, that, is, that times perfectly with our wider societal oppression in the Western world. Mm. But if we want to go by your understanding, which I think is much more positive and much more hopeful, <laughs> and we look you know, at like, the motherland and we look at like, the African nations where like, I think most black people originate from, then yeah, there's loads of joy to be found in, in um, the, the pre-colonial societies. And I wish I knew more about them, 100%. Absolutely. And I think it's kind of like, there's a really interesting phrase um, called like fictive kinship. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that race is very much, or race in the context of slavery specifically, was a process which was very much on a certain level, like the development of new cultures was driven by the need to find new identity in the context of being massively displaced mm -hmm. from where you're originally from. So I think it's interesting to interrogate, like, yeah, like, if you are looking at, at race in terms of the, the, essentially the creation of these kind of stratifications to um, justify oppression, then I think, yeah, black joy is, um, like, very much tied to, to that kind of struggle. But I think we also need to operate in a kind of situation of, like, understanding that the world can really very much be like we can we can take on new lenses when we're trying to understand something and yeah like they both represent just different um kind of angles on the same thing yeah i feel like to just summarize all of this two things can be true at once i feel like i feel like yeah the middle ground <laughs> yeah you know like um we can understand that the formation of the black race came out of like severe oppression, marginalization. Like those two words don't even fully encompass how violent it actually was. Mm. Um, and like centuries of struggle have come out of the formation of races. But it can also be true that <laughs> we say through those formation of races came joy. But like there's joy can come out of this pain and struggle. Like I, I don't think that we need to be thinking like, oh yeah, as black people we're feeling joy, but then like the whole idea of like the black race is formed from struggles, therefore struggles at the root of everything. Like, yeah, two things can be true at once. Sorry, I'm not as like articulate no, no. as you do, but I'm just like, yeah. No, that, that was good. And I think what all three of you is, <laughs> are summarizing really well is the need to be active participants in our own education and our learning, not to just take verbatim what we're taught in the classroom, but to challenge it, interrogate it. Through which lens are we looking at history? Whose perspectives are we looking at? Are we just taking it in and saying, yeah, okay, this is what happened, or are we really thinking beyond that? So thank all of you. Thank you all. For that, it was excellent. Next question. Yep, it's over there. I feel like um, in literature, because I study English literature, and within literature there are so many talented black and writers or people of colour that are writers in literature. And I personally feel like within education, black people have been asking so relentlessly for representation, especially in the curriculum for young people. Um, but what I find is that for, what, for some reason, for some unbeknownst reason that no one knows better than me, um, there are books that are just so sad and depressing that the education committee just choose to project onto us. They're negative and they're depressing. And I just feel like there are books that are fiction and non-fiction that are positive and focus on black excellence that we just don't get. Um, it's just... It's, it's, so, it's so depressing to read these books about the struggle that we've been through and it's gone over time and time and time and time again. It just reminds us of the struggle and pain that we've had to go through, we will have to go through, our children will have to go through, our parents have gone through and it's just repeated and it, it's, it's, it's difficult um, for somebody like me or someone younger than me that knows no better than I of why that keeps getting pushed onto us. So how do you propose... Um, as a talented black author that focuses on black excellence that we overcome that kind of stuff or how we can rebel against it mm. in a positive way. Okay, I was gonna say, I think Sophia should take this question yeah. because she yeah. knows lots about books. And we can, we can chime in in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so 
basically, I'm going to try and tackle that question from various different points of view. The curriculum that we study in compulsory education is essentially decided by those in power in the government, right? And those in power at the moment happen to be the Tory party. And with everything that was going on last year with the Black Lives Matter movement, the resurgence of it, and the formation, well, actually, they had been long before then, but the black curriculum had been lobbying the government to change the syllabus, to include more like black voices, to show the full breadth of what you say, the, our experiences and our emotions and our perspectives. And unfortunately, at the well, Gavin Williamson, who's no longer the education secretary, but he, when asked about it, he still believes that the empire is something positive that we should be celebrating. There's a real... There's a push happening from two sides. There's younger people throughout education, compulsory all the way up to higher education, that are fighting to change the education system, that want one that's more representative and that isn't just exclusively white or exclusively about Britain, but that looks beyond that. And then on the other side, you've got the people in charge, the governments, who want us to continue revering and celebrating empire and don't see anything wrong with it or anything bad with it. And so we're at this point of immobility where do we go from there and I think to answer your question about what can you do about it I think there is some leeway within the classroom you can ask your teachers to incorporate it more in fact your teachers really the responsibility should be on the educators to continue educating themselves if they've you know grown up like a lot of us have just reading books by white authors then it's on them also to educate themselves, to read more books more broadly from, diff from authors of different backgrounds, to incorporate that into the curriculum and do whatever they can within the power that they've got, but also as schools and as institutions to lobby the governments because, you know, the indi as individuals, we each have the power of our own voices and what we ask people to do for us or how we approach our education, but there's levels. It has to be from the educators too, it has to be from the institutions all the way up. So sorry, that was a really long-winded answer, but yeah. Smashed it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, smashed it. <laughs> I, I think like, I completely agree with everything Sophia is saying, like the pressure shouldn't be on you to widen what you what you you're learning because at the end of the day you're the one that's learning so but I think it's great that you are already being critical of what you've been made to feel as like objective which is the education system and school and stuff so if there's anything immediate that you want to do like here and now um when I was in school I had exactly the same thing but my English teacher was even worse. He saw, like, Alice Walker as a non-traditional author, so I shouldn't have her in my English coursework. I ignored him. I did it anyway. Got an A-star, so... Uh, <laughs> well, I, so I'd say, like, with the small things you have control over, definitely try and, like, exercise that little bit of agency that you have. So the English coursework is a good example, like, picking... I don't know how it works with... Um, your exam board, but I was able to pick books for my coursework, so I picked books that mattered to me. When I was in university, I made sure that I was, like, reading things I just personally resonated with that still, like, related to my um, subjects. And also, I think, um, one thing that I wish I knew earlier on is that, like, school and, like, these institutions aren't the only sources of education. Yeah, amen. Like, if you're not feeling fulfilled educationally from your school curriculum, and most of us really aren't, because I think the curriculum is absolute pants, it, always, it has been for a long while. There are other ways, like you can read things, so you can, if, like, if you want recommendations from us after this, we can give you some books that you want to read. There are loads of, like, Black Girls Book Club is amazing. Bad Form is another publication that um, platforms marginalised authors. In my school, actually, my friends and I set up a book, a book club, which is probably a bit nerdy, where we, like, read things or, like, talk about things that were happening, um, and that really helped me. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Sophia's right, like... Yes, there are things you can do, but don't feel like the pressure's on you to be making this change. Like, what you're saying is a problem with the system. Was there a specific point in time when you personally felt like your race limited your chances of making it in life? If so, how did you overcome this? Can I direct that question to Atiyam? Because you, you do youth parliament work, and I think this could be a really good opportunity for you to answer. So the question that. was, like, about not making it, right? Um... 
I don't think I have made it. But I think we even have to challenge, like, our notion of making it. Like, I think there's so much more to human existence than, like, achieving things. Like, I'm, like, I can't lie and say that I'm not someone who's, who's trying to do things and, like, trying to be ambitious. But that's not... You shouldn't try and make that the total of your existence. Um, and there's, like, so many other interesting... And a lot of the most fulfilling experiences don't necessarily come from the pursuit of a certain goal. And you also have to just be, like, quite willing to reckon with um, the existence of, like, failure. Because even last year, like, I've flopped at so many things. But, like, that's an important aspect of learning what you need to learn and really then being able to apply it to the situations that you have. And often, like, the failures that you experience are things which it's better to fail earlier than fail later. And the key thing is just about failing forward. Like, just fail in the direction that you want to go in. Fail upwards. Um, <laughs> the whole yeah, government. Like all the politicians. Um, no, um, I think that's a great point. And I think that often people look at a certain career or, like, wait, you've got to somewhere... Um, and they think that there hasn't been, like, quote-unquote failures along the way. Um, but, like, the amount of times I've messed things up, done things wrong, and I had to kind of reset and, like, kind of rid myself of the guilt and move forward. Um, yeah. But to, to go back to the question about, like, whether or not race has, like, hindered um, any opportunities that I've, like, attempted to take, if that was the question, am I right? Yeah, I, um, I think that it's a great question because th the nature of racism is so insidious often that you don't... You, it's hard to... It's often hard to definitely know. And so you might not achieve something, you might lose an opportunity, so on and so forth. But actually to be able to put a pinprick in it and be like, that was racism, 100% racism, is often really hard because people, you know, it's not... It's unlikely in most scenarios um, that someone's going to be outright and overtly be like, I didn't give you that opportunity because you're a black person. Um, so you just have this, these niggling doubts. And, and I think especially when you're a teenager, especially when you're younger, um, I dismissed so many of those niggling doubts because I didn't want to um, like be a victim. I didn't want to... like. I think I was like... I was very much of that attitude when I was younger that like we're over racism like you know the, our generation is going to be the generation that where racism no longer kind of exists kind of thing um and and now I look back just even at the going back to some of our earlier conversation even the culture we were consuming mm. at that time and it was it, it actually was pretty over and and a lot of the experiences that I teed away as you know oh, it probably wasn't actually probably were um but because I kind of packed them away and put them in a box I can't remember a lot of them and I don't know if that's healthy <laughs> it's probably not healthy re repression but yeah um it's how you survive isn't it yeah exactly yeah. it's survival I'm trying to think if I have anything to say about like if race my race has hindered anything it's so hard because I'm not gonna lie I feel like I'm still victim to that mindset of like w working through it and so I don't know it's it's really tricky because I was the same as Charlie like I really didn't want to play the victim um and uh, I don't know if it's good advice or not so I don't want to <laughs> say anything that is like really problematic <laughs> I think oh I don't know I think I'm just trying to oh you know what I'm actually just not going to say it because I don't want to yeah I, <laughs> oh you can't leave us uh, like so that. Just, we'll tell I, you if it's problematic yeah I right. think I think for me it's like I've gotten to the point now where I almost don't want to see certain things as being like oh yeah that was done because of the color of my skin or like because un unless it's a really grave injustice unless it's like oh it's so hard it's it's just really hard like, you is that because it makes it easier to exist and like just live and not get bogged down by yeah i think i think it's the kind of thing where if you for me anyway I went through a period of doing that, but it just ended up being a thing where, like, I fell into, like, a bit of a hole and I was like, okay, there's almost no point of me even trying anything because I am a black woman. Like, I've got so many things stacked against me, so, like, life is meaningless and all of that. So I think I've been trying to move past thinking in that way just because when I was thinking of that way, I just wasn't doing anything or putting myself out there and I was really afraid of failure. And it was, again, tied to this idea of, like, black excellence of, like... I didn't want to fail because there was pressure on me to like be the best, but I knew that my the colour of my skin was stacked against me, so I was scared of trying to be the best, and it was all yeah. of this stuff. Like, oh. I think 
one thing that we have to be careful of doing is not like tying as black people our validation to institutions that are set and kind of orchestrated and constructed in a way to exclude us. Like we really, I believe ultimately in this concept of like institutional duality, that as much as like there are resources that we have to get from certain institutions and places we have to move in, we also have to build our own. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And I actually think it was something that, that saved me a lot of the time in my early journalism career. So say I'm strutting into these like big, big fancy offices, like, you know, the first person in my family to like do a professional job. And the thing was that one of the beautiful things about being working class is that you don't, well, certainly in my family, we don't actually put a lot of power on these places. Like, you know, it's not, because, so it meant that like, I had quite a dismissive attitude to some of the like people who I'm supposed to be afraid of or I'm supposed to be scared of. And, and that was really empowering, like actually. And it meant that I was able to not kind of get bogged down in, in some of the like nasty institutional nonsense that happens in these places. So yeah, that would be my advice. Like no one in a position of power is any better than you. Um, it's, it's, it's all about how you view it and like how much, um, uh, like weight you can give yourself in those moments of, of initial fear, you know. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a perfect way to end today. Thank you so much, Atty and Charlie and Timmy. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> and thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the questions too.